Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you here. Um, my name is Betsy Fisher Martin, and I'm the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University, and a faculty member there as well. And we've got quite the panel with us today. Uh, we've just heard a lot on the Democratic side. We are going to jump in to the Republican end of things, and we have one Democrat for good measure on well, the I didn't panel know I was as well. On this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did not get lost, Joel. You're supposed to be on this panel. Joel Benison, of course, uh, longtime pollster for the Obama campaign, Clinton campaign and always has really good insight into what is going on with the electorate. So we're fortunate to have with uh, him with us today. Uh, next to him, at least Jordan, of course, you probably recognize uh, from uh, her role as a political analyst on NBC and MSNBC and a contributor for Time, uh, but also um, used to work in the Bush administration and has a lot of insights uh, on Republican strategy as well. And of course, uh, Michael Steele, the former uh, RNC chairman and lieutenant governor of Maryland, who might be back into politics at some point soon. We'll see, we maybe get to that a little bit. <laughs> uh, and Doug Hyde, who uh, is a longtime Republican communication strategist uh, in the White House and in Congress. So um, we've got a, a great discussion. Including two stints with him, yeah. so. And, and yeah. we're here to tell about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's start first with a little bit of, from your perspective, we spoke a lot on the earlier panel of, about Virginia and New Jersey, but I want to get your thoughts, first of all, on what happened there. Um, did we see sort of a, a playbook of how Republicans are gonna run in the future, or was this specifically tailored to this moment in time and this kind of governor's race? Um, Mr. Chairman, let me, let me start with you on that. Well, it's great, it's great to be uh, back here uh, with the NYU family. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, so, you know, I, I've kind of looked at this race for a while now, and certainly, um, Knowing Terry uh, personally, I don't I did not uh, know uh, Glenn Youngkin, um, but understood his background, and he was he was tailor made for that race, mm -hmm. um, and uh, on a number of levels. And he very early came out and did the one thing that every candidate should do, and he did it unobstructed, and that was define himself. Right. You know, he had the nice little sweater vest, he had the family thing, people liked the vibe, it worked. Uh, Terry McAuliffe, who I, I know for a long time, uh, surprised me by not responding to that and getting in front. So the narrative of November of this election was really set early on in this campaign, uh, irrespective of, of a number of things that we've talked about relative to the Biden administration where his poll numbers were, COVID and all these other things. Mm -hmm. Voters began to like Yunkin early and they had no reason to come off of liking him, right. to stop liking him. He was not him. a dislikable person. Right, so it said a, said a number of things about the kind of candidates Republicans need to begin to think about in this post-Trump era. And that is not just the ones who can do the Heisman to mm -hmm. Trump, right, mm -hmm. which Youngkin did very successfully, but also can come across as concerned, committed, uh, engaged, good listeners, have a plan or two that can be put out there, but most importantly, people like. The narrative about Republicans, certainly during the Trump era, was that people didn't like Republicans. Uh, and what Youngkin, if there's a playbook, if there's a plan, and I don't think there's an absolute playbook because this election is not gonna be what you're gonna see in 2022 because of this one factor, the kind of candidate that Youngkin is versus the kind of candidates who are already lining up in a number of GOP primaries around the country that are much more Trumpy, much more in bed with him and his, and his style of politics those candidates are gonna have a hard time getting voters to like them, particularly right. in swing states, uh, unlike Yunkin, who took advantage of that early on. So if, if you were doing the recruiting as, as chair of the RNC and trying to get candidates to run, is it too late for that now? Or can you try to recruit some? Oh no, it's not too late. Yeah. You, you, you got the primary season is, is not even, I mean, you know, it's just really starting in many respects. You've got a lot of folks who jumped in early in places like Ohio and Pennsylvania right. for sure because seats have opened up when people announced that they were retiring uh, from, from, you know, for the Senate, for example. Um, but no, you, you, you've got to be focused on getting in, and Doug and I know this well because this was very much a part of our strategy in 2009 going into 2010. 
Doug uh, was not in our comm shop at the time, but he was in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> um, having worked with me in my 2006 campaign for the U.S. Senate, and so we had an understand of how understanding of how you start the early communication yeah. about your candidates and about the kind of candidates you're looking at going looking for going out into the states and sort of you know you know grinding and finding those candidates and lifting them up so when you find them the interesting challenge is going to be how successful the party is uh, sustaining them and promoting them with the, the background noise of Trump's endorsement for that candidate over there in that same primary. Right. Um, and I think Virginia, one last point to note, I think people really need to understand, Youngkin was lucky. He didn't have to run a primary. Mm -hmm. He ran the, the convention, the party took the option of a convention, cleared as much of the field and the deck as they could to put him in a position, probably maybe, maybe a different outcome if he had to run through that primary gauntlet with a, a bunch of Trump-type candidates, um, uh, you know, nipping at his heels. Yeah. Don't know, but that was a difference maker as well. Yeah. Elise, let me ask you, was there a point in the, watching the campaign when you sort of felt the ground shift a little bit? And was there a particular issue, like maybe the issue of education? Um, what was the impact of that on the race? Well, the story that was percolating around local media yeah. about the violent parent at in Loudoun County, and this was back in June, and this was an example that of, oh, how crazy things have gotten at school boards. And then right-wing media reported, no, it's actually a dad who's upset because there was this you know, transgender bathroom, which actually wasn't the case. And there were so many, it was a case of sexual assault, but there were so many twists and turns and the school administration lied about it. And at that point, it was just an education battlefield. And I think this is where we're going to go forward with in 2022, education as the new issue. And is that going to be for Republicans? Are they going to take that over just like Democrats seated trade in the unions, and is that going to now be a Republican strength with education turning into more of a culture war issue? And then uh, also August with Afghanistan and those images, and Virginia was probably one of the only states where I think that foreign policy would have any impact, but you have so much of the Beltway crowd and then down in Norfolk and a lot of military in Virginia, and so that uh, coincided with Biden dropping in the polls and then Terry really losing his strength in the race too. Right. Doug, let me ask you from a communications perspective. I mean, the Youngkin campaign, their narrative, their communication, you didn't hear them nationalizing this race. There was not a lot of discussion about Biden, mm -hmm. right? They just focusing on kind of local issues. Um, obviously an effective strategy for them. It was, and it was to the point where not only were they giving the Heisman to, to Trump, yeah. they really didn't have anybody coming in and campaign. This was a right. Virginia, to <laughs> overuse the, the term that's overused, this was a Virginia first campaign, so to speak. Right. And it was a very smart tactic of Youngkin to do because it allowed him to disregard all the other noise that was, that was there and allowed him to remain focused on issues. And you know, given that he had the opportunity, which, you know, as, as Lieutenant Governor, he's always going to be Lieutenant Governor, <laughs> um, uh, highlighted, he was able to define himself early. And yeah. not just without um, McAuliffe responding, but without McAuliffe defining him on the air. When you're a candidate who's emerged from a primary or from a convention and you're a new face, that's a real opportunity for your opponent, who probably has more money than you, which McAuliffe certainly did at the time, um, to define you, that that didn't happen, mm -hmm. really allowed him to move forward. And on, on the issue of Biden, I don't think he really needed to bring up Biden. Biden was brought up enough as it was. And when we were at the RNC together in 2010, mm -hmm. our magic number for Obama was 46. We felt that if he was at or below that on election day, we'd take back the House. Obviously, Biden is much below that. Mm -hmm. And that's true in Virginia. It's true throughout the country. And so when we started seeing Afghanistan, mm -hmm. And combine that right. with Terry McAuliffe's answer on um, on parents and schools, which has on a communications to level level, I never understood why he didn't at least clean it up and say, "Well, of course, parents should be involved," and then say everything else that he said. Had he said that with his initial answer, Glenn Youngkin may not be the governor elect at this point. Yeah, Joel, I'm sure you've <laughs> already dove through the election, the exit polls, right? But what's jumped out to you there? And then talk a little bit about that 
Biden factor? Yeah, I think two things. Um, Democrats have to be careful about um, not trying to tie every Republican who's running to Donald Trump. That's yeah. one thing. Um, candidates and campaigns matter. Um, when I looked at the uh, final results and the exit polls, um, last time Terry McAuliffe was elected governor in the state of Virginia, he won independence by 10 points. Youngkin won them by nine. Mm -hmm. um, you got to be paying attention to that. You don't win elections in America, and certainly not, and I disagree with those who say Virginia has been a democratic state. It is a battleground state, and it still is. But you don't win from the left or the right. You win from the middle out. And if you can't connect with people and their lives of those centrist voters, whether they're leaning left or right, you're not going to win elections in those kind of states. Um, we'll talk about this state more, but for example, um, we're giving a lot of short shrift to New Jersey, and I yeah. think the early TV <laughs> did that. Mm -hmm. Here we had a Democrat get elected twice in consecutive terms for the first time in 40 years. And all they're talking about the night of election is, well, his margin's not as big as it should be. That was a historic win. I mean, it was Brendan Byrne 40 years ago, and they held both houses of the legislature, the Senate and the Assembly. So I, I think that we get caught up in the meta narrative, and that's yes. partly driven by the media, needless to say. Yep. But candidates, I always say this, campaigns and candidates matter. And uh, I don't quite uh, reject or accept fully what Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local, but a hell of a lot of it is. And when you make a blunder like that to the point that, you know, Michael uh, and, and Doug have made, um, you got to clean it up. Right. You got to go out and say right away, you know, of course parents have to be involved in their kids' education. It's the most important thing most parents are thinking about. And if you look at where that took a toll on his numbers, it was more in the kind of southern suburbs, Richmond, central and southern suburbs, is where he really gave up the margins that had helped get him elected last time. And, and of course, so, quick yeah, anecdotally go ahead. Yeah. about New Jersey. Yeah. Um, I was in New Jersey in mid October, and when I got off the um, exit on the Garden State Parkway, I was in Homedale, which is a bit more of a Democratic area. And I saw jack signs everywhere, which made me scratch my head. Mm -hmm. Rumson, a bit more Republican. Okay, that made yeah. sense. But over the, over the two, three days I was there, I kept hearing from Democrats and professional Democrats, this is going to be very close. When I would tell people in Washington that, including before interviews on TV and during the TV interviews, they'd look at me funny, move back onto the critical race theory question that they wanted to ask. Right, right. And right. I never got a single question about New Jersey or a follow up. <laughs> they just paid it, no attention to it. Yeah. Well, and to Joel's point about not running against Donald Trump every race, turning, uh, trying to make Youngkin into Trump. Yeah. It just, it, work. it wasn't viable. Right. Like, the guy's in his fleece. He's a former Carlisle CEO. If anything, they could have attacked him on private equity. But instead, they tried to go yeah. after they the corporate executive. They didn't do the executive. bank capital business or oh. any of that, exactly. right? That's why yeah. the Tiki Torch stunt really failed. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this issue of education, and what's interesting about it is I think it can mean different things to different people, yeah. right? Parents' control of education. It can mean the CRT. It can mean masks. It can mean, you know, material in the classroom. Yeah, I, I, that's an excellent point, and I, I think for for me, when I when I looked at that moment and and saw how it played out, the the, the one thing that struck me was the McCullough's answer on on education mm -hmm. was for him what defund the police was for Democrats in in 2020. At the end of the 2020 campaign, it sucked all of the momentum out, and I think gave a lot of impetus to uh, Republicans picking up 12 seats um, that weren't necessarily there six weeks before. Um, and so the, the messaging part of, uh, of a campaign is critically important. But to Doug's point, how you respond when there is that gaffe, that blunder, that mistake, that misunderstanding, whatever you want to fr frame it as, you've got to be able to get in there and clean that up and, and to rewrite the, the circuits for the voter who are now beginning to look at what you just said in a whole different way, with a whole different meaning. Terry, if he had said to the point, yeah, of course every parent should, should have a, a say in what's going on in education. But I also know every parent doesn't want to see their school boards overrun by someone who has this, that, or other agenda right. that is not related to the education of their kids. There are ways in which that could be cleaned up. Um, so this, this environment um, now that we're in, 
Uh, I think you're going to see Republicans use education as an avatar for all the sins that they want to foist on, on, on Democrats. Um, and the test for you Democrats is, uh, what's your anecdote? Are you prepared to play? Because I don't think in the reality of it, at the end of the day, Republicans do politics better than Democrats do. Democrats come out and they lead with their policy and they've got their 10-point plan and their stack of papers and all of that. And Republicans look at that and go, can you believe this crap? And the, and the country goes, yeah, what's all, I can't have time to read all this stuff. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So the reality of it is you've got one team that's playing politics that will take uh, a message and use it as a political cudgel. Right. You'll have a other, other team paying policy and trying to wrap their policy into a message. And that becomes very difficult to do, um, particularly if when you come up against someone who's beating you over the head with your own message. Right. Where do you go? Right. Well, and, and Democrats, and Joel, you can speak to this, when you look at polls, they always are plus on the issue of education. Yeah. And so was it a mistake for the McAuliffe campaign not to own that issue from the beginning and to be vulnerable on it on the end, not, not to hit the Yunkin campaign on teacher pay and the things that Democrats usually hit oh, Republicans uh, on? A hundred percent own it from the beginning, particularly yeah. in a state that has a significant amount of its vote coming from suburban communities. Right. Right. And where you need to win as a Democrat, you're going to need a lot of suburban women in particular. Suburban men are a little more conservative than sur suburban women. But in that state in particular, you've got to be able to win that those votes. You're going to win it in the suburbs. And you can't not be prepared for that. And I think that if you think about a lot of people who live in suburbs and people who live in cities as well. It would apply across the map. What do parents care most about in their kids' lives if they've got children at home? You know, we break out polling by women and men, fathers and mothers, with kids living at home because they care about getting their kids a good education right. and keeping them healthy second, right? Or keeping them healthy first and education second. It's right up there. So you have to have a strategy for that right from the beginning. And it surprised me that you could make, he's a pretty skilled political guy, to make a, a blunder like that on an issue that's so fundamental that he's been connected to for a long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I don't think ultimately it was a gaffe. You know, he said it one time and didn't clean it up. In fact, what he did was he doubled and tripled down. And right. on election eve, had Randy Weingarten on stage with him. So this wasn't a gaffe, it was a statement of policy. And it's one that happened in the broader context. I think everything that we talk about with education is defined by uh, schools that were closed. And so, Every parent in Virginia and across the country essentially became a homeschooler overnight, whether yes. they were prepared to or not. God bless and them. That, <laughs> that was the warming water that fed the hurricane that allowed Youngkin to really win yeah. on the issue of education. The only thing I, I, would, I would pick there is there, I think that it, it was a gaffe. I think that, you know, when you make a blunder, you got two things you can do. You can either double down on it <laughs> yep. or you can yep. clean it up. And you better have a really, if you're not going to, you know, if you're going to double down on it, you better have some numbers in your polling to back it up and know that you can survive it. And I don't think in this case he could survive it. No. Right. Yeah. Uh, we were um, I was teaching a class at AU this semester on the, on the governor's race and took 23 students down to Richmond for four days. And so we talked to a lot of voters. But... On the issue of COVID, this, this struck me. Um, one of the voters that we talked to, she said, and, and um, you'll appreciate this, she said, I I'm voting for Yunkin, and I have never, ever, ever voted for a Republican in my life. You know, she was 48, a couple of kids. She said, it's the masking issue. Um, I don't want to be told um, for the mask mandates. So I guess I just want to get your thoughts on as we look ahead to the midterms, I mean, hopefully we won't be having this mask issue <laughs> again, but what is that impact on, you know, what a government can instruct people to do, the mandate component, because it really did upset a lot of people. You know, I, for me, this, this whole issue around the mandates and vaccinations and that, yeah. all of that, it boils down to leadership. Mm-hmm. I, I still believe, and, and, and maybe, my friend, if you've got some numbers to, to back this up to, to your last point, if it, you got the numbers to back up what you're about to say. Um, but I, 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 would, I would tend to believe that um, 
if we had started our, our national conversation on COVID differently than we did, that we would not, A, have 700,000 Americans dead, B, uh, people wrapping the flag around the mask, whether to wear it or not, uh, C, um, giving credence to somehow, you know, avoiding vaccinations, uh, particularly if you are a public servant uh, who serves the public in a very direct way, um, because the leadership makes the difference. If a president of the United States confronting this crisis had come out and said, my fellow Americans, we're, we're in a state right now, we've gotten a lot of information that's flooding the zone, um, but there are some basic things that our scientists and our researchers and our, our CDC and, and World Health Organizations are telling us we can do. So for, for the sake of your health and your family and community, we need you to put on a mask. And to show that, I'm going to put mine on right now, and I'm going to do the rest of this press conference like this. And I'm going to ask you to f join me in this moment. It's a very different conversation to the American people then than coming out saying, I'm free if I don't have a mask. You know, it's my right not to I wear I don't want to look weak. Yeah, no one is yeah. questioning your rights. We're asking you to preserve and protect yourself and your health. So these things for me uh, on this issue, when I hear a parent say, you know, say that, I don't want the government mandating a mask. Well, the government is mandating the mask now because you didn't wear it and this thing blew up on us. And, and so now we're in a spot where you, you, we have to deal with the reality that it ain't going away, which we've already talked about. It's, going, it's, it's still here. It will become endemic. We're going to probably wind up having to take a shot against COVID every year, just like with the flu. So we have a responsibility and a role in this as well as citizens. But especially our leadership, I think, let the nation down on this in this moment. And Not a partisan thing, but it's just yeah. a fact. It just, it just is. I think Michael asked if I have some data. It just so happens I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and it's, it's an interesting piece of data. We did, I did a poll with Neil Newhouse recently mm -hmm. for Senate Forward, right? Neil and I work together a lot when people want a Democrat and a Republican, right? I try to get Elise <laughs> to do it with me sometimes, but she says I'm not a pollster. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we, we asked a question in there, and overwhelmingly, the American public agrees that we can't get our economy moving until the pandemic is over. That's right. And That's right. the Biden administration must know this. They're not communicating that right. in that way. And so, and, and, you know, I'm not here to be critical of anybody on either side, but if that's where the American public is, right, and they believe that our economy is not going to get moving, then link those things together in a way that connects with their lives. And any politician could say, a Democrat or a Republican, that we want to get life back to normal as much as you do. And you know we need to end this pandemic first and foremost. And then you can move on to talking about other issues. But if it's not linked back to the biggest pain point in people's lives, you're not connecting with them. Yeah, that's exactly right. Right. At least you're nodding. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's interesting, though, how we're talking about COVID being such a factor on the ground in Virginia. But I feel like a lot of the media narrative has focused on education just under the lens of critical race theory yeah. and the culture war. And but so it, it makes a good cable. It's cable a good, segment. exactly, <laughs> from the cable news yeah. producer, you know. No, I never produce cable. I <laughs> 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 worked out with a job. Only the best for Betsy. Um, so then we're, you know, it's almost as if so many factions, the loudest voices, and then on Twitter. And so this debate is completely overtaking the debate on children in school yeah. and masking and COVID. And then you end up with an even worse divide because those who are concerned about their kids in school feel like they're being called racist. And then those who are offended by the emphasis on critical race theory, they are not you know, getting that taken seriously enough too. Mm -hmm. Well, while you have the floor, I wanted to also get your thoughts and just go back a little bit on the issue of Trump and how candidates moving forward, are they gonna try to do, where does the Trump light work and where does there have to be this kind of full embrace um, moving forward? Well, Virginia just, the Virginia Republicans got so lucky just because of the convention. And it's going to be hard to replicate mm -hmm. in other places, but I think you're already seeing where people are 
putting names forward that would not have necessarily been in vogue. I'm, I, you know, just this week, David McCormick, David McCormick. the CEO of Bridgewater, right. his name was floated for Pennsylvania Senate against Sean Parnell, who is literally most Trumpy of Trumpy candidates. And uh, so you see names like that that perhaps are being influenced by Youngkin's victory. Yeah, and he's out of the Youngkin mold of... Exactly. And I thought it was just luck, though, that Donald Trump didn't have some kind of temper tantrum and insert himself. Oh, he did. And he tried. I mean, he he really... It was like he he kept saying they were going to have this tele-town hall, but it was like invitation only and no press. So it's like, if a tree falls, <laughs> did it really happen, right? I, but I think that, that Lisa raises a very interesting point about Trump, and, and a number of people have mused about, isn't it odd that he hasn't, you know, come out and just slammed Youngkin, particularly when Youngkin uh, was, uh, you know, denying him publicly. I mean, Youngkin played the Judas and, and yeah. Peter role perfectly. I mean, he just rolled those sapsuckers up into one, into one uh, character. Uh, and 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 Trump was okay f- with that, and I think I think I know why a little bit. Um, for Trump, uh, he could suffer those that outrageous you know assault on his person um, because if he got the win, right, in a race like that, in a state like Virginia, good enough, it sets him up perfectly going in. So all his other minions in all the other states. Um, fall in line, Mm -hmm. right, very nicely. He gets the bragging rights, and we saw literally within hours of, of, you know, the the trend line in that, taking credit and saying, you know, my my voters got Yunkin across the line. So Trump was playing a little bit of a long game looking into next year using this Virginia race. Notice he didn't talk a whole lot about Jersey. The focus was on Virginia. Yeah. Um, and, and so the reality, the reality for, um, for Trump was, how do I uh, s- use this to set up what comes next for whatever he wants to do and however he wants to do it? So I think he's, he could suffer a little bit there. And the other thing is, Youngkin and Trump talked a lot more in this campaign than, than was reported. So um, that was another thing. Youngkin was like, that's a, you know, that's okay. That's I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna say, mm-hmm. but you know, mm-hmm. right? So you don't need to get upset. <laughs> so there was a whole lot of that back channel. There obvi- yeah, and obviously there was some staff communication. Absolutely. Too, right? yeah. So people don't don't think that this Heisman maneuver was all just oh running away from Trump. It it, it was a Heisman, but it was like this. <laughs> right. You know? right. And, right. And I think it's a little bit more um, telling now afterwards um, because Trump's reaction. Was was so level-headed and consistent uh, throughout, and that's because Junkin was keeping him. And it was a real evolution in strategy. You look at 2018 and Martha McSally, and how in Arizona she just had to cover herself in Donald Trump, and to the point where big donors were like, "This is Arizona. Why can't you just, you know, (laughs) yeah, go a little?" But the but the strategy mentality among operatives was that you couldn't have any deviation with Donald Trump, and so I do think that the spell at least in states that are more up for grabs, where there is a contest, has been broken a little bit. Yeah. And that's, that goes to your point, Joel, about Pennsylvania. Because if you do get um, uh, a counter-narrative going against Parnell, it changes, it, particularly in a state like Pennsylvania, which is a, a lot like Virginia in many respects, right. uh, particularly with the suburban uh, areas. It changes the dynamics for Republicans in a number of, of, of races around the country, potentially. But Republicans still have on the back end going into 2022 if uh, President Biden is able to lock down uh, that, that baseline infrastructure legislation, get it passed and on his desk, which he may have done and maybe already signed today, <laughs> if not over the weekend. It sets up a different narrative uh, uh, on policy and politics for next year, because it's going to be a little bit harder, particularly in some of those swing states, to go, you know, you know, owning the libs, as is the mantra among a lot, a lot of folks on the right, um, who are saying to people who are now enjoying, uh, you know, the fruit of going back to work, um, construction projects underway in their community, uh, COVID uh, in a better place on COVID. We've gotten through an academic year, yeah. right? Kids back in school. 
moms in suburbia feel a little bit better. Very different narrative. Uh, you've got to have something to say to those voters. You're going to have to say something to them other than, look, you know, they're not doing anything for you because they will have done something. Right, yeah, if the scenario gets rosier. Right. Yeah, so, Doug, what, what do they say? Well, uh, Republicans? Yeah. I think I think it really depends on where the president um, yeah. if we have is. If we have this kind of jobs coming back. Yeah, yeah, let's say the president's yeah, back at 50, 50 percent. Well, then, yeah. then it's a different scenario. One of the things that I've tried to caution a lot of my Republican friends with this week um, is stop measuring the curtains. Yeah. Um, I had, in fact, even before the midterms, or before last week's, um, this week's elections, I had somebody tell me last week that it is a done deal, it is in the bag that we're going to get the House and the Senate. <laughs> it is not. Um, sure, we can talk about historical trends. Sure, we can talk about the president's approval rating. Um, but your job is not to measure curtains right now. It's to build a house right. so you can hang the curtains. Right. Um, and until Republicans can get from that mindset, which we saw from leadership this week, talking about 60 seats. You know, when we were at the RNC, we didn't no. barely even internally in 2010 did we talk about taking back the House until after Labor Day of the actual election. I got in a lot of trouble for not going out and bragging that we're going to take the House. I said, I don't even have all my candidates who are going to run in a primary. Mm -hmm. How am I going to go out and say we're going to win the House? Mm -hmm. and, and even then, remember, Doug, people underplayed. You know, you know, Carl Rove came after me and said, we should get 39 seats in the House, and, and we're not going to do that. So, of course, after the election, I said, I got 63, Carl. What do you say now? <laughs> you know, but you've got to do the work, is what you're saying. You can't measure those traits without doing the work. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's, that's both the national and the local. Yeah. And, you know, I think what we saw in this election is, you know, we saw a lot of national politics at play, and then we saw very smartly a lot of local politics at play. Right. And that's, you know, that's how Republicans almost won in New Jersey. It wasn't just Biden's approval, which was bad in New Jersey as well. It's property taxes. Yeah. And property obviously, taxes. if you're running for Congress, you right. can't really run on property taxes per se. Um, but there's a whole lot locally that you can still emphasize. Yeah, and then, you know, there's just a lot of difference between running for governor and then running for yeah. Senate, right? And what voters are looking for. It is less kind of mm -hmm. about local issues. Joel, let me ask you, where do you think that Democrats are most vulnerable looking ahead to the midterms? Um, you mean broadly politically or specific places? Not specific places, broadly. Yeah. I think that um, there are a lot of big numbers being thrown around about these bills that are out there and yeah. what do they all mean, and I don't think there's been good, strong messaging about what's in it for me. And whether we're talking about Build Back Better, which is the social policy bill, but sounds like infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure bill has great stuff in it that people want. I don't think we're talking enough about it. Clean water, so no parent ever has to worry about whether the water their kid's drinking is clean or not or broadband internet, and um, so no school child in America should sit on a school bus to do their homework because we can't get internet to their community. That's a shame in the United States of America. And I think they're not talking about that stuff, and what we're in is an inside Washington game mm -hmm. that's consuming the energy and the conversation, and frankly, that's never good for Democrats. Mm -hmm. It's too process-oriented, it's not enough people-oriented. And we gotta get back, because we can deliver and will deliver if we get this stuff done right. You know, somebody again mentioned, you know, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. You know, we've got people who are voting so much more all over the country because of all the different means. When you hear the word voting rights, do you think about an old liberal bill? Or do you think about protecting every voter's right to vote the way they want and make it easier for Americans to vote in the greatest democracy on earth? <clears throat> it's a simple shift in message. Doesn't change the substance, mm -hmm. but gets us to a point where you'll get everybody's heads nodding. And that's what we need to do going into the midterms and going forward. Well, what Anybody about the fracture them? within the Democratic <laughs> Party? Like, how do, you de how do you deal with the far left? I mean, James Carville was on the other day talking about uh, the, the Democrats and talking about, you know, we got to get rid of this, like, crazy wokeism everywhere, right? And how, does, how do the Democrats navigate through that? Well, look, I, I, I can't say how the party leadership has to deal with it, but the numbers are the reality, yeah. right? You know, if you look at liberals, moderates, and conservatives, ideological, you know, framing of your own personal political preferences, liberals are the smallest group. We, we never win from the left. After the election, Joe Biden got elected uh, against Donald Trump. The biggest difference in his win in 2020 versus Hillary 
Clinton's defeat in 2016 mm -hmm. was Joe Biden outperformed Hillary Clinton among two groups that overlap, independents and moderates, but he outperformed her by 12 points. Right. That's the difference between winning the presidency and losing it right. narrowly. And Democrats need to understand that. We, you know, and I think the previous panel addressed this a little bit, right? You know, our fights are being hashed out in public. Um, I think we're not thinking long term about how are we going to build this party in the strongest way possible. And I think, just like I said, you have to win from the middle out. You yeah. better build your party from the middle out. And I think that's, that helped Phil Murphy become, as I said, <laughs> you know, the first Democrat reelected governor in New Jersey in 40 years, right? He did govern from the middle out and ran from the middle out. Chairman Steele, you wanted to jump in? No, I, 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 I was just wondering, has anybody bothered to hire Joel? <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it is, it, the thing about a lot of our politics today is a lot of folks tend to make it much more complicated than it really is. It really does boil down to a lot of things that we heard from the first panel and what you're hearing here. It's communication, and, it's, and communication starts with listening. The one thing I've learned since I was a county chairman across, uh, across town in Prince George's County uh, is voters will always tell you what they want. They will always tell you what they want. They will always tell you how they feel. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't hide anything from, from people who play in this space like we do. What is crazy is how we get it so wrong, how we don't understand the fact that they're saying, I don't want my kid to learn X, or I'm afraid this is going to happen if, if this, you know, comes to my community, or why don't we have clean water, you know? And, and everybody overthinks it in politics. It is very simple. Listen to, my mother told me when I was a young kid and she, she watched me growing up and she said, you know what you need to do is just learn to shut up and listen. <laughs> and it is, it is so true uh, that in politics it's the first thing you have to do and yet we get it so wrong. McCulloch got it wrong because he didn't listen to what the voters were saying about the, his opponent. Right? right? We like him. Okay, why do you like him? Because he's going to actually do something we like, and that is eliminate the, the tax on food. Yeah. On groceries. All right, so what's your counter to right. that? He was even hyperlocal. I mean, one of his events, he said, you know what? I'm going to reform the DMV. Two things are going to happen when right. you call. Right. A, they're going to answer the phone, and B, they're going to say, how can I help you? Like, and who doesn't like that message? And, well, and you know why that works? Because all those people who were standing in line at the DMV the yeah. day before were like, thank you. Thank you. Finally. Right. <laughs> Finally. So voters will always tell you. And, and I think Joel, you know, in, in the work that he does, uh, has a very good sense of where those lines are. I think uh, maybe someone said in the last panel about the it was more like this as opposed to Karen said yeah it's more like it's more like moving like this the lines are moving like this on in this road it's not the straight shot mm -hmm. and whether you're talking about COVID whether you're talking about the economy where you're talking about education whatever it is that road is being shaped by voters right and we as political players elected officials uh, political wannabes have to know and learn how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And we seemingly don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think as a treat, we have some real people in an audience, which is amazing. <laughs> but we do have a few students here um, in their masks. And so I understand we may have a couple of questions in the audience from some students. Yes, no? Yeah, there we go. Is there a mic? I'm okay. a very loud guy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Mm -hmm. based on the year's current political um, climate. And he said that the Virginia gubernatorial election is going to be kind of a glimpse into what it might look like. So now that we have the results, what do you think, and I know we touched on this a little bit, what do you think that the 2020 season is going to look like and how will the Biden administration change in trying to deliver their um, campaign promises from the platform that they ran? 
great. Who wants to take that? Sure. Um, yes, well, I, I would say two things, and thanks for the question. Um, we've got two things happening um, right now. One is the history, and historical trends tell you that it should be, and usually is, 2002 being like one of the few exceptions. It was a good year for you. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. And for Maryland. <laughs> um, tells us that the party that's out of power should do well. Um, and so if Republicans had a merely bad year, they'd pick up enough seats to win the House, so it would be a great year for them. Um, then you have the reality on the ground, at least of where things are now and where they're potentially going. If the elections were today, given what Biden's numbers are, you know, if he's at 42% compared to Obama at 46%, which was where we want, he was at 45, 45. Mm -hmm. we're looking at him being 46 or below, very, very bad year um, for, for Democrats. Add, re, add redistricting to that, to that as well. Mm -hmm. What we don't know, um, just look at the news today, um, 500,000 jobs and, um, a new Pfizer pill as an antiviral. And so, you know, Gottlieb was saying today, COVID may be actually over, over, still may be endemic, mm -hmm. um, but at least as a daily concern, mask wearing concern by January. Well, if Joe Biden's creating half a million jobs, or the American economy is creating half a million jobs a year, and COVID's in a distant memory, it's a different landscape. And so that's, you know, unfortunately why you have to, it's like the Super Bowl, you have to play the game to see who wins it. We have to go through all of this to figure out what's going to happen. If I'm betting, I bet well for Republicans, um, but there's a long, long way to go between now and then. Yeah. Anybody else wanna jump in on that? Well, I think um, one um, probably um, mistake Democrats have made is not being attentive enough to state legislative races mm -hmm. in 2020. Yeah. 2018, I think we picked up about seven governors mm -hmm. and about a comparable number of at least one house of a legislature. So at least you get your hands on the rudder of reapportionment to some degree. And without that happening, I think we're going to have some very tough maps mm -hmm. in 2022. And we really, we, we didn't take, you know, the, we didn't look at that as an opportunity. I think we were very focused on the presidency, which we, you know, and, and you know, all the other races, which we had to do. But you can't lose sight of that when you're looking at going into reapportionment, and that's what mm -hmm. would keep me up at night if I was a Democrat right now. Mm -hmm. At least what do you I do think, though, I am a Democrat. That, yeah. <laughs> I think that the Pfizer news about the new antiviral right. and what Scott Gottlieb said about we really are, this is going to end pretty soon, that knowing that the pandemic probably is going to be done by the midterms, that's definitely good for everyone, but I think it's good for Biden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And that's a huge unknown that I feel like weighed on the Virginia race too, just because of the education issue and yeah. how it how it layered on that. But then also the other unknown is this big spending package. And is there going to be runaway inflation? Is housing out of control? And will there be another crash? A big black swan event like that. That's how does it I all get paid for? How does it all get paid? For? <laughs> well, hey, it's a, but they, it's it's, amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's all I, it and pays by the way, for itself. I, we haven't used a word yet in this panel that is one of the driving concerns for voters right now. It's inflation. I was yeah. going to say. And so, right. five hundred thousand jobs a month—that is fantastic. Right. That means inflation is only going to get worse. And as people are, you know, seeing a one percent rise and in, in increase in their take home pay, yeah. if they're seeing a 5% rise at the grocery store or gas prices right. or what have you, and we still have um, supply issues, these are real problems that it doesn't, doesn't appear to be very easy to solve. Right, not only are you ordering your Christmas presents in October, but you're paying a lot more for them, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yes? So I'm uh, just doing what I've seen on Zoom. Zoom. Uh, so uh, the question I've got is a little bit, uh, I wanna offer the Republicans on the panel a chance to respond to something we heard in the previous panel, which is something to the effect, and I'm seeing some of this on Zoom too, that Republicans have no policy. That um, you know the, the Republican platform in 2020 was rubber stamped from 2016, that there isn't any real policy development coming from the Republican party, but instead it's more the party of no. I'm sure you disagree with that and I'd like to hear why. Actually, I don't. That's, no. that's, ex that's exactly what I was heading towards when I said what I said about Republicans, how we're going to have to uh, come to the table with something. We don't. I mean, uh, we don't have a counter infrastructure plan. We don't have a counter um, uh, social plan to deal with, uh, again, the issues that moms and dads are out here telling us that they're concerned about whether it is daycare. What's, our what's the Republican daycare plan? I'd like to have one, right? Um, uh, you know, as, as a candidate or activist or party leader to be able to go out and sell that to the voters. 
Um, uh, but we don't. I mean, this is the same fight that I could regale you with uh, when I was uh, RNC chairman, or when it was on health care. We had internal battles for those who thought that uh, they didn't want to go out and engage on the health care issue. I'm like, we got 40 doctors in the house. I'm sure we can come up with our own plan. <laughs> um, but, you know, there is this, this speaks more broadly about where we allow our leaders to take our politics. We take it to zero sum. So it is easier, better, and the grift is greater when I can own the libs as opposed to owning policy and actually going out and putting on the line our credibility, our values, our ideas behind a set of policies that we think will work for the American people. Um, when you give up on that, this is what you get. It's easy for me to throw shade at, you know, my Democratic friends um, than it is for me to engage them and say, dude, did you, you know, three and a half trillion dollars, do you know what that means? And this is what it looks like. So what we propose is X. Mm -hmm. um, and, and losing sight of that, I think, has done a great disservice to the American people. And I'll just put this out here for the American people. Get off your behinds and start holding these people accountable for something. Right. You but just can't sit there and go, oh, okay. Who dictates what the message is going to be? Is Trump still the leader of the party in many respects? Absolutely. Yeah. And look, Donald Trump wasn't elected as a policy platform or to, or to really have a deep series of, of platforms. Right. He, was, he was a rejection of the system. He was voted as an at, in as an attitude as much as anything else. And so, you know, the party follows their president. And so that's part of why we've seen, you know, things where they are now. Then put yourself in the minority in Congress. Your job essentially is to say no. <laughs> say no, right. So, you know, you have a lot of time on your hands to talk about policy, but ultimately you're voting no on everything from... Um, you know, the final, final vote on the floor to, you know, every procedural motion that there is. But that's, but that, to Doug's point, that's the House. That's not necessarily the case in the Senate where we know the minority can play a much more substantive role uh, as opposed to just saying no or blocking and tackling. Um, you can put forward um, through the leadership, you know, when you're in the minority in the Senate, uh, counter proposals, a uh, different set of ideas, making the case. It's not just a matter of holding up every nominee that comes forward or saying no to, uh, you know, any provision. I mean, when you get to the point, folks, where you're saying no to have a debate about something, I mean, the, w what do you expect your government's going to do if that's if that's if that's the go-to? We're just going to say no to even having a discussion because we got nothing to offer. That's essentially what it is. And so, you know, I think we can and must do better than that. And I think re Republicans, uh, to a lot of what's already been said, will find themselves um, scrambling a little bit if the numbers turn in the Biden's favor, if people feel a lot better about where the economy is, whether we are in COVID, and that, you know, and those aren't big ifs. We can, all, I mean, 500,000 jobs today, we can see the trend lines there. At some point, you're going to have to have something to offer the American people other than no. Elise, is, talk about the role of Trump moving forward. What you see with so many of the politicians who are trying to be Trump's follow yeah. on act is they're just cheap, inauthentic imitations, <laughs> and they just can't carry it right. off. And, you, you know, the Ivy League sycophants yeah. who try to pretend like they're, they're the worst. it's it is just so fake and it's not working and whereas like in a previous incarnation of political history you might have had someone like Josh Hawley or yeah. Ron, De, uh, Ron DeSantis down in Florida who were associated with big ideas mm -hmm. much like you had you know John McCain was known mm -hmm. as a foreign policy heavyweight you had George W. Bush compassionate conservatism Jack Kent in poverty, and you just don't have these major Republican figures that are associated with the power of an idea and seemingly a genuine passion for anything but owning the libs on Fox News and creating a viral moment by being obnoxious and following in the model of Donald Trump. And I just, I think no one is as good at it as Donald Trump is. And if the economy does, you know, continue along this which is a, a really big if, yeah. 
Yeah. But I think it gets tougher for Republicans if they aren't offering anything in response to a ton of infrastructure spending. We have another Zoom question. Uh, yes, I'm getting a couple of folks who are angry that um, NYU could not find what they are calling a pro-Trump Republican to appear on this panel. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, let me let me kind of uh, again distill what I'm seeing, and um, I want to talk. Uh, Ron DeSantis, are there um, Republican governors who are doing these moves on policy that might be meaningful and give Republicans a way forward in terms of something substantive in 2022 and beyond? No, I think I think most of it's been a wait and see. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you're, you're seeing people certainly flex some political muscles, certainly travel quite a bit, going to mm -hmm. Iowa, New Hampshire quite a mm -hmm. bit. Uh, Mike Pompeo, DeSantis, Nikki mm -hmm. Haley. Uh, but as far as developing policy, they, they, they are not investing in the campaign infrastructure, the hiring of people um, specifically, um, because in some cases Trump or his super PACs are doing so. Um, but also they don't want to they don't want to really draw Trump's ire. Um, if any of the 27 you know, most likely uh, people to run on the Republican side were to announce their exploratory committee tomorrow, let's say it's Ted Cruz. Well, Donald Trump will come at them not on Twitter now, but he'll come at them with a howitzer and that removes. Ted from consideration. Okay, who wants to go next? No one. And that's part of why you're, I think you're seeing that, you know, that hesitation. So how does, how does Trump play this? When does he, does he run? Does he hold out to the very last? Why, why wouldn't uh, he? Yeah. It benefits him. If, if, if you're somebody who likes attention the way that Trump does and you don't even really need to do much to get it, you know, do your rallies from time to time. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. Yeah, I'm not convinced he, at this point that he actually gets in the race, but there's a lot of power uh, to do what he's doing mm -hmm. right now, and that is to uh, hold certain players at bay. Look, we even saw just a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, when all that noise, that good love and favorable noise started bubbling up, up about the, the governor of Florida, uh, Mr. DeSantis. Oh, yeah, how he got, and he was yeah, being he got upset. Yeah, he was hurt. Winning, oh, yeah, he hurt. was winning those, those polls in Utah yeah. and, and, and other conservative states where he was becoming the favorite candidate. What did Trump do? He dumped him like a hot <laughs> but He was like, uh, you know, all of a sudden he couldn't get it right. He wasn't the best, you know. And, and so to Doug's point, you know, uh, Donald Trump still wants to control a lot of what goes on and inside of, out, out of the party. So I just put it out here like this as a former national chairman, county chairman, and state chairman. All right? How are you spending your money? Are you investing it in candidates that, are, that you've endorsed? How many checks have you written to all those candidates that you've endorsed? Right? Because that, to me, tells me whether or not you're going to actually be the leader of the party. Mm. When you're building a $200, $300 million, you're, you're sitting on more than the RNC, and you want to be the head of the party, then baby, get in the ring and start leading. Put your money where your, where your mouth is and, and not just, you know, get these candidates to beg for your endorsement, but actually see through. How much money did you give to Yunkin in his campaign? Endorsement is nice, right? So for all the folks out there who are mad that a Trump person isn't on the panel, then okay, fine. But just tell me, like Janet Jackson said, what have you done for me lately? Or put your money where your mouth is. Or put your money where your mouth <laughs> and is. Also, something we haven't pointed out, Youngkin was able to, I think, dump twenty million of yeah. his, own his own money, money. into his yep. own campaign. So That's he was free. He was truly free, financially liberated from right. needing to bend the knee. Well, one thing that concerns yeah. me about twenty twenty four, if Trump doesn't work, doesn't run, you know, we'll have however many people running. You know, the multi multi tiered debates and so forth. Well, oh God. <laughs> Based on what we've seen, you know, just over the past um, year with all the audit, uh, yeah. all the audits, what's to say that anybody is going to accept the results of the Iowa caucus? If yeah. you came in second, if you came in a third, you can say it was fixed. They're going to even rigged. be an Iowa caucus. Yeah, right. that's what I mean. Right. Well, Iowa, given you know some of its past troubles, yeah. would be most at risk. But yeah. New Hampshire, South Carolina, we could see the party eat itself by Republican candidates saying that they won't accept the results. It was a fix. It was a fraud. Right. I actually won it. I didn't come in second. And what the national party and state parties do, I don't know, but it's a, it's a terrible scenario. That is. <laughs> well, it's a bit, it's a, you know, bit once you make it, you, yeah, right. you're going to wind up lying in it. I mean, and that's the reality of attacking the electoral system the way we have uh, as, as a national party, uh, you know, going after, you know, uh, early voting, going after 
uh, vote by mail, which, uh, as I remind people, how do you think we, we won in 2010? I had to get ballots into the hands of my seniors who were <laughs> unable to get to the polls. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet you have the leader of the party, as he is, wants to be called, telling voters just uh, a few weeks ago, y'all shouldn't vote. Republicans don't, don't vote in the election. Just don't vote. I'm like, <laughs> okay, so what do you say when they lose? I mean, it, so it, 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 when you're unserious about, about uh, your, the voting, when you're unserious about the responsibility we have as citizens, um, then you, you, you just have to push past that and you have to really begin to focus as a party on, okay, what do we do now? Right. What do we do next? And this goes to the, the numbers that, that Joel um, digs into. It goes into what Elise was saying about the kinds of candidates that are coming out who are finding their own paths, creating their own ways, whether through their own money or resources. It's great to have that kind of independence, but the party also needs to be connected together at some point, and it's harder to do. And the Trumpian candidate isn't a new phenomenon. Yeah, you know? yeah. right. Yeah. Sharon, yeah. Mentioned yeah. earlier, Sharon Engel, Christine right. O'Donnell, right. Todd Akin. Uh, right. The party of twenty. This is not new. Yeah. Republicans, that, right. in theory, could have seven more Senate seats if it were not for, you know, Trump in Georgia and some of those other candidates. Yeah. It's a very different political yeah. world. Right. But at least let me ask you, Dave, when we think of twenty twenty four, and if Trump, you know, waits a long time to decide spending his time criticizing other potential candidates as they sort of raise their head and then decides not to run, what are we left with and who is out there to sort of lead the party? That's a tough one. <laughs> that is a tough one. I mean, right now, the donor class favorite is clearly Ron DeSantis, and that's who big Republican donors are hoping mm. is going to fill the void if Donald Trump doesn't run. But... There's a lot of time. I'm not willing to make any prediction there, but I do think it will be, remember how painful it was with all those Democrats on the debate stage, yes, and yeah. then in 2016 with all the Republicans, we're gonna go through, through that. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah. if Donald Trump doesn't yeah. decide to run. And I, right now, I think he definitely would, if I had to bet, I would say Donald mm -hmm. Trump definitely runs. You agree, Chairman? Uh, he runs? It, no. I, I, <laughs> I just don't. I just don't see the uh, incentive beyond um, beyond controlling the process and having everyone bend the knee. And and that that is so much more fun than actually having to go and do the work again. Um, but that's that's today. We'll we'll see. I think if you take this environment coming around this recent election, to Doug's uh, point about where the the numbers are, you know, if if Biden is under 50 percent, I mean, significantly under 50 percent, mm -hmm. the economy is stalled, inflation is uh, the the rule of the day. Uh, parents are still, you know, a little bit upset, and noxious about uh, everything else that's going on in, in their classrooms, et cetera. Then that that opens up a much wider berth, but in a a much more balanced or favorable environment uh, for Democrats. Biden's at 50 plus, economy is doing well, people are going back to work. I don't see that. Uh, it makes the case for a dissent for a Republican governor uh, who can talk about having governed through COVID, governed through uh, recovery and all of that. Uh, I, just don't, I just don't see Trump wanting to do that lift. But, you know, uh, that's today. Uh, this time, you know. <laughs> Long time from now. Six months from now, very yeah. different. I think we have time for one more Zoom question. Uh, sure. So um, I wonder, uh, and this is uh, what we're seeing from Zoom here, I, I wanted to give you all an, an opportunity to react to something that J-Mart said in the previous panel, which is, uh, can't we agree that one lesson from the v Virginia gubernatorial race is that greater access to the ballot box, no excuse absentee, early voting, helps both parties, that it's not um, helping one party or the other? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Lieutenant Especially Governor. Especially when you say still vote. Right. 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 You don't, and you right. don't discourage people from not in your own party from voting, period. Yeah. Look, and Chairman was talking about um, 2010. You know, when I first started in politics in 1990, 1992, Republicans had this thing called the absentee ballot chase program, which to me was like the most innovative thing in the world. I couldn't believe it. You would get ballots to somebody, and then you would call them incessantly. Um, and we've given up on that. Um, mm. It should be in Republicans' advantage to do so. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I, I you know, the, absolutely. Uh, voting is the heart of, of our democracy. It is, it is, we are empowered, uh, our government is empowered because our Constitution empowers its people. And the reality for us is we, the people, are the most important part of this whole governmental system. Uh, and yeah, we understand why the founders now <laughs> didn't want political parties uh, to be in play, because they just kind of muck it up. But the reality of it is, as citizens, we, we, own it, we owe it to each other um, to engage in the battle over big ideas and small ideas, uh, to help support each other. So yeah, uh, greater access. I never understand, never understood and still don't understand why Republicans are seemingly so afraid to engage on that battlefield of ideas. I don't need to fix the race if I got a better idea. Mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about uh, how you vote if I make my case to you and feel confident in that. Um, and, and I think that we've now seen over the last six, seven, eight years of heritage, Brookings, big think tanks, small think tanks, political parties, law firms, courts, looking into and dissecting our electrical, electoral system and finding how much fraud? How much? <laughs> how, how many, I could, you could, how much? <laughs> so we've got a good system. Um, let's stop scaring people from using it and, and treating them like they're not smart enough to know how to use it. And, and sapping their energy and their access to it. And, and I think that's, that's the way up for Republicans. Um, and I look for, if DeSantis wants to be president, then come to the table with that discussion and say how much you want people to participate, not afraid that they do. Any closing thoughts from you, Joel? Um, I think um, what I'm going to watch going forward is probably a little bit less of the presidential, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and more uh, something that Neil and I found in the Senate Forward poll again, which is that um, you know, everybody focuses on the president's approval ratings, but when we looked at parties in Congress, um, mm -hmm. both parties were underwater. Democrats were minus eight, Republicans were minus 17. But when you look at that number among moderates, Democrats were plus three, and Republicans were minus 26. Mm. And I think that there's something going on here uh, that the obstructionism uh, on the part of the Republicans in Congress could really bite them badly in the next election um, because re voters are generally frustrated with Washington, but it certainly seems, notwithstanding the president's numbers not being as strong as you'd like at this point, Republicans in Congress have a pretty big problem to overcome. I also would think Donald Trump might exacerbate for them. Well, I think we are out of time, so we're going to leave it there. But to go back to what Chairman Steele says, that the power of the vote and the importance of voting, I think, is, is um, a good way to, to think about it and a good note to leave on. So thank you all thank for you. joining us. Thank and you. I think we'll be back thank with you. the next panel shortly.